here at Duke Spine Institute Surgery Center Vieira. And we'll be performing our final surgery for the day. Our patient is suffering with a herniated disc at L5-S1. And as a result of that disc herniation, he has mostly ideally back pain, but also leg symptoms on the left side. So due to the nerve root that comes out at L5-S1 and goes down the leg, our patient is having symptoms related to the nerve root that's right next to the herniation. Now our patient has what we call a pseudo disc or a fake disc at L5-S1, but you know we're calling it the S1, S2 pseudo disc, so the disc above that is the abnormal one. We'll see that on the x-ray. So let's go ahead. Do you guys see the pseudo disc on the, the x-ray yet or not? Yeah, it's right down there. Uh, let's see. All right. Yeah, that's a tough one. I think it's right there. You put your finger on it. No, that, yeah, right there. You see it? You see a cleavage plane in there? So I believe that's the pseudo disc, and that means the one above it would be the L5S1 that we're treating. Now let's see if there's anything else I can use to to verify that. The pedicle of the S1 is extremely short, and then L5 gets much longer, and that's kind of what I'm seeing on the MRI as well. Uh, as far as the anterior curvature of the sacrum, it goes curve and then it bends the other way, curve and then it bends the other way. That's exactly what I'm seeing at the pseudo disc. That's what I would expect to see. And then the L5-S1 disc is almost flat, but not quite. So, whereas this S1-S2 points down more. And then the disc at above 5-1 is pretty normal, and that's what I'm seeing up there. So I believe that that is 5-1, that we all are in agreement. All right, sir, Dr. Duke, we're going to get started, okay? That's my hand touching you. And I'm going to get started just in a second. Okay. So they're going to feel a little stick and burn. That's normal. Yep, just lay still. You're fine. Afraid. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Just uh, two cc's injected. All right. Are you okay? All right. You're fine. Dr. Duke here. We're going to get started. Damn, I have band. Num num. So. Um, the last two surgeries today were done on the, the right side. This patient's surgery will be on the left side. Everything's okay. Dr. Duke here, shot. Let's go lateral, please. All right. With a little luck. We'll be close to where we need to be. Otherwise, we'll need to move south a little more. All right, so I think our um, trajectory is a little bit higher than I want it to be. Now, let's see what we can do with those end plates. I think we can do a little bit better. I don't think we're terribly off. Let's just try wagging a little bit, see if we can make it better. I think you're very close. No, I go the other way. shot yeah uh, I think that's um, I think that's a little better okay so I'm still a little high need to be a little bit lower shot want to shot shot
Sean? Uh, I wonder if we can clean that pedicle up a little better, the top pedicle. Give me just the two degrees of wag. Yeah, we're going to ask you some questions, and that's better. And then we're going to put you to sleep, okay? I apologize for the discomfort, but I can't do the surgery without you being a little bit awake to help me out, all right? In the beginning. Shot? And then I'll put you to sleep, I promise. Shot? Shot? Yeah. Are you feeling anything at all? No. Shot? Shot? I believe that's 5-1, that we're calling 5-1. Let's get an AP view. No leg pain? How much is of your problem is back pain versus leg pain? That's perfect. Go back to the lateral. Ninety-five percent is your leg. All right. Okay. Shot. That's it there. Shot. Okay. Can you scroll through that MRI for me? Are you comfortable, sir? We're going to put you to sleep in just a couple of minutes. Let me see that MRI scroll. Okay, the other way. Yeah, it's a foraminal herniation. Is that yours? What is that? It's like, is that like Chinese? Instrumental music? Huh? Uh, are you comfortable? How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Huh? Ten. For back or leg? Uh, back. Huh? Back? Ten. How about your leg? Nothing in the Nothing. All right. Well, is that where you typically get back pain when you get it? Uh, it, it varies mostly in the leg. But is, when you get back pain, is that where you get it? When you get back pain, is that where you get it, that location? Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead and count from 1 to 100 out loud. If you make it to 100, we don't pay our anesthesiologist for the day. <laughs> Just kidding. Nice and loud. You're doing great. A second so we made our incision keep going you're doing good shot is that the guide wire there keep going shot give me a second and I'll be able to answer the question shot Shot. Yeah, that's the guide wire. So it's right at the front of the disc, which is fine. Shot. So just before I answer our question from the audience, I just want to say um, if you look at the pedicle, which is that little part of the bone that connects the vertebral body to the facets, it's very, very short. Very short. So this patient has something called congenital stenosis. And congenital stenosis means basically your pedicles are short. That's what causes, you're born with it. 
congenital means you're born with it, okay? So it's an abnormality of the pedicles that people are born with. And I can tell you the herniation, you can see it right where the wire is going in the back of the disc. It's not that big, it's small. But the reason he's having so much leg symptoms is because his pedicles are short. You see, if he didn't have the congenital stenosis shot, if he didn't have that short pedicle, he would never be having leg symptoms from this small herniation. So when people, doctors and patients and radiologists all look at the MRIs, if they don't look at everything, you can't really make sense of why shot patients are having their symptoms um, unless you look at the whole picture, okay? So a small herniation like this would be overlooked by 80% of surgeons. They would say it's too small, but, but they're not looking at the pedicle. And the pedicle is very important because that determines the neuroforaminal diameter. Uh, all right. So, so far, so good. We're getting down there. I will take the question. Oh, all right, so somebody out there has had back surgery two weeks ago, a back fusion, and they're, they're coughing a lot. And they're wondering if having COVID is going to complicate matters. And the answer is it certainly could, um, but the, the coughing itself I'm less concerned about. And the reason is this, if you had a discectomy only and not a fusion, I'd be more concerned about the coughing because every time you cough, you, you valsalva and you increase your, your disc pressure by two to three fold over normal. So if you had a discectomy, I would be more concerned. Like if you had a Duke laser disc repair, I'd be more concerned because we didn't stabilize that segment. But if you've had a fusion, you have screws and rods, that segment's been stabilized. So you're actually better off because you had a fusion with respect to coughing and having a, a complication from coughing itself. So I think you're gonna be okay. As far as COVID-19, if that's what you have, um, it, it all depends on how your body responds to it. And if you respond to it like, you know, if you have already had a coronavirus, for example, and this is my opinion on COVID-19, COVID-19 is a coronavirus shell, but it has some other types of viruses mixed in there basically engineered in there purposefully by somebody. Basically, we know who that person is. They live in China. They're from China, from Wuhan. But um, there's HIV components in that virus, and there's SARS components in that virus. But the coronavirus proteins, the spike proteins on the coronavirus um, are, are shared with other types of coronaviruses. They're very similar. And so I believe that people who have had multiple coronavirus infections in their bodies over the years, not the COVID-19 infection, but just regular coronaviruses, they're gonna have um, what's called a T cell response, T memory cells that are ready to go and attack any viral infected cells in their body quickly and basically eradicate the viral process from spreading. So what I see is People with COVID-19 have, ha have very, very different responses to the virus, depending on, in my opinion, whether or not they've been exposed to coronaviruses before and whether those coronaviruses are similar shot with respect to their, probably their, you know, some antigen that's being presented on your cells. So if you have a moderate or severe response to COVID-19 during your recovery from back surgery, it could be bad. We're talking about respiratory distress. We're talking about a two week duration of symptoms of nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration. Those, particularly the dehydration, could be life threatening when you're recovering from a fusion surgery but for anybody with COVID-19. You're doing great. Just stay asleep, shot. 
When you wake up, we'll be all done. You're doing good, shot. So it depends on if, so with the cough, I'm not worried. With the COVID-19, I am worried, but it really depends on what your response to this, to this COVID-19 is gonna be. Are you gonna have mild, moderate, or severe disease? And I don't know what, what state you're in, like how many days you've had it, the cough, but you know, if you've had it just for a day or two, and you're just starting out and you have a fever, then make sure you stay really well hydrated. Um, I can tell you a few other suggestions as well. One of them is when you, if you have COVID-19, anybody suffering with COVID-19, people tend to get gastritis, okay? Which is a inflammation of the stomach lining and that's from being um, not eating and it's from taking Advil basically, you know, anti-inflammatories to get your fever down. What I've seen is that Tylenol doesn't work that well. I'm not saying you shouldn't take Tylenol, but you're gonna find that Advil works better. But I know the Italians had issues with Advil. On the other hand, there's been no statement about Advil use as far as I know with COVID-19, but I think the Advil is more effective at getting the fever down than Tylenol. So you're gonna be taking Advil for days. Hey, uh, I need that soap. Plus you're gonna have also no food in your stomach. So you're gonna get anorexic, you're gonna get a gastritis. So make sure you take a proton pump inhibitor. Oh, you do this, okay? yeah, yeah. I don't wanna deal with this. And um, you know, Tums, antacids, and that's going to help keep you from getting nauseated because it's the nausea and what's called anorexia, meaning the lack of appetite that keeps you from drinking and eating. And you want to vomit. You start vomiting all your liquids and then you get dehydrated and you can die quickly. So sorry about going off on a tangent, but um, it just depends on how bad your symptoms are going to be, I suppose. But as far as the coughing, I'm not worried that you're going to herniate another disc. And if you do, you know where to come if it happens. I don't think it'll happen, but you know where to come. Okay, we're in the uh, left side at, at the quote-unquote L5S1 disc. Just lay still. You're doing great. All right, so this is part of the herniation right here. And the patient is probably not entirely awake. He's um, it's kind of like if you're kind of sleeping and someone asks you a question and you're like really, really tired. Maybe you don't even remember it. So we call it a twilight, okay? And the patients who are in twilight anesthesia, they're kind of floating between being completely out of it versus being so semi-awake. But remember, these patients, we don't have a secure airway. We don't have their airway secure with a tube, so we can't really let them completely go really deep asleep. Otherwise, they could vomit and aspirate and die, and we don't want that. So the anesthesiologist's job is not easy. It's hard to, to balance the patient between being too awake or too asleep. Why is this getting caught here? What? All right. So we're inside the L5S1 disc right now. We're looking inside, right? Right in the herniation. What's the problem? Yeah. Everything okay? Yeah, yeah. That's the herniation right there. That's the base of the herniation. And it's pretty fibrous, meaning it's got a lot of scar tissue. And my job is to zap all that stuff away. Now this area that I'm zapping is the annular tear. Right here is the annulus. Everything okay? I'm fine with where he's at as long as you're happy. He's a little bit of movement I don't mind. So here's that herniation right here. Again, I've, I've placed the dilator through the herniation. 
I placed the needle through the herniation first, then the, then the guide wire through the needle that went through the herniation. And then over the guide wire, I brought the um, dilator. That's the thing that looks like a metal pencil. You okay there? You need light? Nice, Luis. Thank you. You see how we need leaders? It's not that people don't want to help, it's just they don't know when to help. So a leader coordinates resources. That's what leaders do. Coordinate resources. And part of the training and coordination of resources. Management of assets. All right, we're right inside that herniation, the tear. And it's definitely scarred in there pretty good. You can see compared to the last surgery I did where that blue stuff just zaps away quickly, right? With the laser. We have the same laser, the same amount of laser energy being delivered per pulse. And yet, is everything okay? You can keep them a little lighter right now if you want. If that helps you. Whatever, whatever works for you. This is not the most painful part. Do you need some light back there? Or are you good? All right. You got an incoming call. Probably a question from Sean. This is what's been hitting his nerve. This is just a big wad of herniation. Is there a current question? Yeah, good question. So one of our viewers is asking, will losing weight always help with back, with helping with back pain? The answer is no, it never does. I mean, when I say never, I mean maybe one in 500 patients losing weight will help their back pain. But the vast majority of people with back pain, they don't get any better when they lose weight. Back pain doesn't come from heavy weight. It comes from the disc having a tear. And I have skinny patients with horrible pain. I have fat patients. I have medium patients. Weight has nothing to do, in my opinion, with back pain, with you know this type of back pain at all. It's a common question, we get it all the time, and there's a misconception out there that being heavy causes back pain. This patient right here has back pain, and they're skinny, very skinny. He's a very skinny, normal looking man, muscular and thin. He has no fat at all. So. Back pain has to do with inflammation in the disc. As long as you have inflammation, you're going to have back pain and leg symptoms. The question is, is what causes the inflammation? And I can tell you what causes the inflammation. It's the, the blue stuff, the nucleus propulsus, the herniation. That causes the annulus to be inflamed. So the herniation, whether it's in a fat person or a skinny person, it works the same way. I hate to see people who are overweight with back pain suffer because somebody tells them, oh, you need to lose weight and your back pain will get better. That doesn't happen. I've had hundreds to thousands of patients that have, have lost weight with back pain and never got any better. And I can remember only one patient in 22 years that told me they lost weight and their back pain got better, but I don't think it had anything to do with losing weight. Stand by laser. I think it just had to do with them giving their, their disc herniation some more time to heal. 
and obviously you weight loss takes time it takes months if not years to lose weight so while they're losing weight their their spine healed itself the spine healing itself is a lot more likely as to why somebody would hold that would get rid of their back pain is the the inflammation goes away because the scar tissue that's forming inside the disc eventually closes off the, sp the contact between the nucleus and the uh, annulus. Why am I getting stuck? You see what I mean? Take it, laser. That's the base of the herniation right there, folks. This is the herniation that's causing his leg and back symptoms. And when I get rid of it, his leg pain will be gone and his back pain will be gone. Well, why is this surgery better than other surgeries like microdiscectomy to get rid of leg pain? Because a microdiscectomy requires the surgeon to remove the bone from the spine. And the bone you're removing is the bone that holds the spine together. It's called the facet. And if you don't really believe me, go look at the, the description of a microdiscectomy. The CPT code is 63030, and it says hemilaminotomy, which means to take half of the lamina out. That's bone holding your spine together. Partial facetectomy, take part of the facet out. Usually the surgeon's gonna take about 50% of your facet joint out. That's like taking half of your knee joint out. Can you imagine taking half of your knee joint out and it doesn't affect your ability to walk or cause pain in your knee someday? Of course it's going to. It may not cause pain in your knee that the day after your surgery. It will actually probably for a few days and then it may go away for a, a six months or a year or two, but it's gonna come back because they just took half your knee out. Well, when you take half of the facet joint out, oh, look at that, look at that, oh yeah. You see that squeezing out, grab her. That's a piece of herniation. You can see the white like thing on it. That's where it, the disc material detached from the, uh, I'm having trouble. There we go. Oh yeah, come on. We can get that out in one big piece. Huh? Oh. Oh, these are always fun when you get them out. Uh, Shit. Yeah, you have another grabber? Like a, let me just go straight in without the scope. Let's go. Give me, a, give me that grabber there. Give me some light. Yeah, it's like scarred in there. You have the bigger grabber? I don't need the Gravzilla. I need something, something more substantial. No, I don't want the same one open. Luis, you got to show your team where everything is you're going to need during surgery. Laser. You can see I tried to grab it, but it just won't come. It's just scarred in there, stuck in there. So I'm just gonna blast it with the laser. See how it's moving? Look at the smooth surface. That smooth surface has been worked on by the inflammatory cells of the body. Not the Grabzilla, but the other one. Fuck. There we go. Eh. Still not satisfying. Come on. That is not the one I want. There's another one. 
it's more substantial than this. You understand? And it's not the Grabzilla. It's a shorter one. It doesn't go through the endoscope. It goes down the tube. Laser. Well, we're making slow progress, but we're making progress nonetheless. About five more minutes, I'd say, maybe eight minutes max. Oh. Huh? What do you say? That's the that's the irrigation. That's normal. That keeps the laser cool, by the way. Otherwise, you get pretty warm in there. The laser can melt steel, so you can imagine how hot it gets. Speaking of melting steel, look at the blast marks there. Each of those dark marks is just one hit from the laser, and that's melted steel. People think lasers can't cut through bones first. There's so many lies and myths and falsities about the laser. It's usually due to surgeons or doctors not knowing anything about the laser, never using it. They just make stuff up, you know? You can, you can make it, you can equate it to racism, okay? It's fear and ignorance. Fear and ignorance as the basis for a doctor saying bad things about the laser. Like there's a lot of spine surgeons out there who've never used the laser on spine surgery. They don't even know how. And they tell people, oh yeah, you don't need a laser. The lasers don't do any good. As a matter of fact, I was one of them. When I got done with my training, because everybody in my program that I trained, they would laugh at the Laser Spine Institute. They would make fun of those people over there. And, and so of course I grew up in that culture of making fun of the laser. So I was guilty of that same ignorance and um, insecurity, so to speak, that drives prejudice, prejudices, that drives discrimination. And I'm not talking about being discriminating against people of color or anything. I'm talking about being discriminating against the laser. The laser is what we're talking about, folks, nothing else. And so I was brought up in a culture of the lasers in spine surgery are a joke. They don't do anything, they don't work. That's what I was taught by my teachers, but they were wrong. And I was wrong to believe it. And then I started to see the results of some of the, the surgeries using a laser because I had the ability to, to try it out and, oh, there's a big piece of herniation. You all see that? That is it. That's the one, but I don't want it right now. I want the microscopic one or the endoscopic one. That's a, a piece of herniation. Now, when I put the dilator in, I shoved it back into the disc. So I'm just trying to retrieve these fragments. It, uh, this one, yeah, this is better. Why is that? Just lay still, we're almost done, all right? You're doing great. You have any questions for me, sir, while we're just about, about to wrap this up? Everything's going really good. I think you're gonna be very happy with your results. Remember not to do too much, okay? Too soon. Let your back heal. Yes, I'm talking to the patient. Laser, just about done. I need two more minutes. Okay, so the blue stuff is a nucleus propulsus that is not just normal, it's degenerating or herniated, degenerated. So it's, 
the nucleus propulsus that's been acted on by the inflammatory cascade. It's been morphed or changed. We call it degenerated, but it's nuclear material that's been exposed to all the chemicals that are released during chronic inflammation. So, things like <coughs> polymorphonucleoside or PMN, you know, these are little cells that your body uses to fight during inflammation. They, re they release chemicals, enzymes basically from their lysosomes during inflammation. And those enzymes, a lot of them are proteases. They chop up proteins, you know, that are found in the nuclear material. They chop up sugars. They're just overall, they chop anything up. They're really designed to fight foreign, foreign bodies, like bacterias, mostly. Anything foreign in your body. That's what these uh, neutrophils are designed to fight off, foreign invaders. So it sees your disc material as a foreign invader. Okay, done. Two minutes. Took me a little longer than I thought. Just about done. Okay. Don't, don't move that too much. Just want to make sure I get all of this looking good. Let's go take a look at that nerve. Right there, you see it? Right there. That's the nerve root. That's the dorsal root ganglion. It's in a little bit of fat and stuff. But you can see the nerve is no longer being compressed. I don't know what that is right there. Let's see. That's a bone spur or what? It looks like a bone spur. Let me have the grabber. Try to get that out of there with this grabber. There we go. That came right off the bone. You can see the diploic bone in there on the end plate. That's the diploic bone. Let's get that laser one more time. A little bit of fat around the nerve. Perineurium or epineurium, I should say. A little bit of epidural veins there. See those epidural veins? 12 o'clock right here. A lot of times we can close them off from bleeding. How's he doing? He's ready to wake up? All right. Just about done. What's he saying? Yeah, yeah, we're right near your nerve, buddy. This is, this is the, it's going to feel a lot better in just a minute. All right, done. Laser off. Why is this not sucking, guys? This is not sucking. Can you check this suction? The suction tube's not sucking. Yeah, why, why are we not connecting that? That should be connected. Okay, scope off. Try something. The entire place. All right, let me show you all what we've done. We have basically treated the herniation right here with a small incision. Just relax, we're almost done, we're coming out. How you feeling? Can you believe you're done? pressure on the paraspinous muscle right there. We're just putting a little pressure. You're doing fine. All right. So, Sean, let's show the audience the uh, incision. Here, seven millimeter incision. All right. Let's show them. Can you see this, everyone? 
The whole surgery was done through this tiny little cut. It's a Band-Aid incision. Congratulations, we're all done. You did good. Thank you, Dr. Argos. You can go home in half an hour. I'm going to call our EBL one mil. All right, Dr. Duke Majin here with Sean and my son Arius, and we're in the control room just wrapping up our last surgery for the day. Duke Spine Institute, we broadcast all of our spine surgeries live every week whenever we have surgery, and they're all broadcast live for free. No charge to anyone to watch uh, in the hopes that by watching our high-definition surgeries with uh, voiceover editing and... Um, answering questions that we'll be able to shed some light out there in the world of people interested in learning more about advanced spine care in the 2020s. We've been broadcasting our surgeries from the Duke Spine Institute now for six years since we had our very first surgery. All of our surgeries are out there on the internet, available and archived, and they'll hopefully serve as a resource for educating the future generations of spine surgeons to do the most advanced spine surgery in the world. Unfortunately, these techniques are not being taught in residencies or training programs around the world because the surgeons that work there don't know how to do them. So that's why we bring you these broadcasts live for free, broadcast around the world. All right, the surgery we just did was a L5-S1 Duke laser disc repair for a herniated disc. Our patient had 95% left leg pain. He had a herniation, it wasn't big, 
but the reason why it was causing so much symptoms was because he had a narrow spine to begin with. And he had the narrow spine to begin with because he had short pedicles. Remember, the pedicle bone connects the vertebral body, the back of the vertebral body, to the facet joints. And that's what makes the arch where the nerve exits. So if you have a short arch, then anything inside that arch is going to hit the nerve easier than if you have a tall arch where the nerve can be further away from herniated discs. So short arch, small herniations are usually more symptomatic, and that's what this patient had. Um, I expect his pain will be gone as long as he behaves and doesn't lift anything heavy, like over 25 pounds for the next six weeks, and as long as he doesn't bend over at the waist to pick things up from the ground, his disc will heal beautifully, and he'll be very happy with the results. It'll last the rest of his life. People ask me quite often, how long does the surgery, like how long do the results last? They, they last a lifetime, however long you live. Um, the Duke laser disc repair surgery is better than any other spine surgery in the world with respect to the durability of the results as long as you don't re-injure the disc before it's completely healed. So for patients that follow the instructions on what to do and what not to do very carefully, and they get the right therapy after surgery, their relief of pain that they get, that 95% of the pain being gone, will last their lifetime unless they re-herniate the disc by doing something, usually doing something they're not supposed to, too soon. Um, so we did a five-year study. We looked at patients that had had their Duke laser disc repair over five years ago, and that was the cutoff. You had to have had the surgery over five years ago and had to have follow-up. And we found that the amount of back pain relief was 95% at five years follow-up, and the amount of leg pain and leg symptom relief, which is your numbness, your weakness, your tingling in the leg, was 95%, identical to the back pain relief. So it, And by the way, the average follow-up for that group was six years. So the cutoff was five years, but the average follow-up for the group was six years. We've yet to publish this data. I'm getting ready to submit it to a journal. As a matter of fact, I've been asked to submit it by an author, and I have to do that. So, Sean, you got to remind me to do that <laughs> when I get back from Indianapolis, okay? Uh, we want to get that published. All right. Well, anyway, it's been a great day. We got a lot done. Our first case was an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, three-level, C4556667. That patient did fantastic. His pain is gone. He has a little bit of discomfort in his shoulder blade, which is typical after that surgery. It lasts a day or two, and then it's gone. But his preoperative symptoms of in his arms and his neck are gone, and his surgery was successful. We did that early this morning, and it was followed by three lumbar duke laser disc repairs, a two-level, a two-level, and a one-level. And all of those patients are gone, with the exception of the patient we just finished, who will be gone shortly. Hope you enjoyed uh, the surgeries today. Again, I'm Dr. Arya Duke Majin. And um, Arya, you want to add anything? Nope. We're going to be uh, back next week with some very interesting surgery. Right, Sean? I believe so, yeah. One of them is uh, thoracic to sacral fusion. Um, and I can't remember why, but it's, that's a very big surgery. So that will take up most of the day. So that stay tuned next Tuesday, and we'll be doing more surgery. Thanks.